This is a little like a time reunion now. In the, uh, Jay Carney, the former Washington bureau chief of time, is joining us for the next segment. Uh, but first, let me describe uh, Shane Smith. Described as the voice of a generation, Vice Magazine was launched in Montreal during the mid-90s as a free punk magazine. Chief punk, Shane Smith, uh, already has an HBO show, a record label, and he's going to build a news and entertainment platform ten times the size of CNN. Smith is joined here today by former Obama White House Press Secretary, Jay Carney, who understands Washington media like few others. Carney, long sparred with the White House Press Corps before leaving his post with the President this summer. Smith and Carney are so good that I am not going to have a moderator. They are just going to go at it in a mind meld with each other. Welcome, Jay. Welcome, Shane. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I thought I was the moderator. Yeah, wait, they told me I was the moderator. Wait, I, just, I want to be the moderator. Who's interviewing whom here? Uh, I'm going to interview you. You get started. Um, so, Obama gets elected. Uh, I was in New York City, where I live, uh, Union Square. Mm -hmm. Joyous, triumphant, um, people hugging, crying. Um, a real feeling that the world is going to change. Um, and now, you know, the mood is different. Sure. Um, you know, a lot, the feeling, I don't know, and you can, you, can, you can give your two cents, but the feeling now, the perception, is that a lot of the stuff has failed. That it hasn't worked. The government isn't working. Right. What happened? So, uh, two things. One is, I think a lot did happen. Policies, you know, economy's growing, creating jobs, unemployment rate is down. We have universal or near universal health care, access to health care, a project that was 100 years in the making. Uh, a lot has happened. What I think you've tapped into is that when President Obama was elected, there was a sense of uh, enormous possibility that, as he had promised, uh, the tone could be changed here in Washington, that the, the, the partisan superficiality of the debate here could be transcended and that the country would benefit. And I think that there's no question that that goal has never come close it's to being met. Worse. It's gotten worse. And the president would be the first to admit that and to regret the, his own inability to, to make that go away. Mm. What I think it tells us as citizens is that no individual, no president can do that. We have to do it. If you think about it, the last three presidents have run on a promise to change the tone in Washington. Mm. Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama. Uh, I think it, it, it's most recent and it's most associated with Obama, but the other two previous presidents have said the same thing, and not, you know, both oversaw a Washington that only became more partisan and more ac acrimonious and more gridlocked. Uh, this is why we need political reform. Our system's broken. I think a lot of people in this town and in this auditorium would agree with me that the gerrymandering of our house district is a, is a principal cause uh, of the kind of nonsense that we all have to suffer through and inability of Congress to get anything done. And uh, the but problem is political reform is not an exciting Sure. But if they, can't, if they can't get anything done, how do they reform? So, well, that's a, it, it, the Congress is not going to do it. It's got to be, and we've seen some action out mm -hmm. in the states, it's mm -hmm. got to be state by state because they control how the districts are written and drawn, uh, and it's got to happen there. But the only way anything happens is there has to be some kind of popular momentum behind it. And, mm -hmm. and you know, most people say they want political reform when asked, uh, but nobody votes on political reform. And that's why politicians, if, it were, if, if there was a payoff to mm -hmm. campaigning on it, politicians would campaign on it. Because the payoff really would be sort of, they would get kicked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they, they, you know, the other guy would win. Right. Or the other candidate would win. And yeah. because people aren't that motivated by those issues, they're principally right. motivated by other ones, uh, national security and the economy. And since we're here to talk about media, mm -hmm. so you have this, you know, polarization that's happening in, in Washington that's leading to gridlock. <clears throat> but... Do you think, how much of that is fueled by media? Because you have Fox News on mm -hmm. this side, which is sort of talk radio, op-ed, 
right. um, you know, stuff. And then you have on the left, basically comedy, you know, pointing fingers at the, at the fat guys at, at Fox. Um, um, fat old guys, because yeah. I'm a fat young guy. Yeah. But, um, so you have, and, and basically what happens is, you know, it's entertainment. Right. And so therefore, whatever is the craziest wins. And, and so you have no one saying, hey, let's reform this, because that's boring. But if you have you know, a Ted Cruz out there, it plays well in Peoria, as they say. Well, and I think that what has happened is that self-identified conservatives and self-identified liberals go where they're going to find news that affirms what they already believe. Mm -hmm. and that's obviously uh, damaging to the cause that we're talking about, about fixing the broken system. Mm -hmm. And so the media itself is sort of suffering from a systemic failure. Mm. Uh, and I think what is refreshing about, uh, and note the transition here, about some of the uh, new media ventures that we've seen is that there is sort of a return to real news mm. and non, uh, you know, news without the, you know, the, the, the political, you know, not seen through the political lens in the way that uh, news is so often seen, especially television news, uh, through the major channels that you talked about. Uh, I think what, what Vice is doing is, I mean, if you look at the, the, the documentaries and the, and the news channel, uh, you know, it's, it's unvarnished reportage. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very old school in a new media form. What Vox.com is doing is similar, you know, I mean, nothing is more sort of old-fashioned. Similar than but not as good. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> That may be the case, but it is explanatory. It, mm -hmm, is, sure. it, is, prov it is providing uh, information uh, in a way that it can be hard to find in, in some of the traditional media. So to go back to, to, to me being the moderator, <laughs> um, you ha so we have this, this sort of polarization that's happening in, in media and in politics. Now, one of the things that I'm personally uh, passionate about, but also I think is a, is a tremendously confusing issue in America is sea level rise, global warming. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to <coughs> Mayor Bloomberg about this uh, the other night, and, I, and I was, he was saying it's a media issue. And I was saying, well, I, you know, go to Texas, where they have a three-year drought. All the cows are gone. Mm -hmm. And Rick Perry's like, it's not happening. Rubio State is sinking. Not happening. Right. Right. So. <coughs> When you look at this issue, and it's one of the only countries in the world where we're still debating that it's, in, it's an issue at all, when you have 93% consensus, which doesn't ever happen in the scientific community, right. why is it that 40% of this country doesn't believe it's happening? Why is it that politicians won't go out there and, 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 and by the way, what's happening now is interesting because Republicans who had been you know, virulently anti, are now realizing they're not going to get elected mm -hmm. if, if everybody swings because of them. So now all of a sudden it's changing. But how important is that? And what the hell is going on with climate change denial in this country? So a couple of things. One, the fact that you see some politicians realizing that they can't be in denial permanently because there'll be a political cost. That is what will motivate uh, politicians to act, mm. uh, to do something about it. Now the problem is if you wait for the majority to actually feel like they have an immediate self-interest uh, to address by, by taking care of doing something about uh, climate change, we may wait too long mm -hmm. to get something done. Uh, the, the, the problem, though, is the, the you know, instant gratification that politicians and our political system, politicians seek and our political system rewards. If you're in Florida and the long-term challenge of climate change means your state's sinking, that's not a, that's not a problem that Marco Rubio or any other politician in Florida has to worry about today, or next Tuesday, or the Tuesday, mm. the first Tuesday of November in 2016. So uh, there's not a compelling interest to address it. What I do think, that in, in our sort of traditional media, where you have a problem yeah. about the, the sort of on the one hand, on the other hand, there aren't enough uh, voices of authority calling BS on that, well, it's still a matter of debate. I heard, why? why? I think that there, there is a tendency that can, not uniformly so, but there's a tendency to, to hide, you know, to maintain your objectivity by simply uh, saying he said this and she said that. Mm -hmm. Instead of basically saying what he said is patently sure. false and, yeah. what, and what she said is, is based on science. I think mm -hmm. that the Ebola uh, situation now is, has a similar aspect to it on the issue of how you 
could contract Ebola mm -hmm. and whether or not you, it could go airborne. Mm -hmm. Now, I heard politicians say, well, we don't know. Some experts say it could, you know, it could be contracted, uh, it could be airborne. Well, no, they don't. Yeah, some mm -hmm. do, maybe 5%, kind of like the climate denial. The ones paid by right. Philip Morris do. So, uh, <laughs> the... Uh, Used to be paid by Philip Morris. <laughs> The, uh, now are paid by. Is, is, you know, the media, the responsible media, and, the, and, and not the partisan media, but the, but the authoritative media needs to call, call out that kind of nonsense. Okay, I will. Yeah. Um. So, but, but here's the fundamental problem, or a fundamental problem, which is, as you know, I, and Margaret mentioned, I was, uh, you know, old school reporter from traditional media, Time Magazine, for 20 years. And this is where you make fun of me. Uh, I'm not, no, I, 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 I look to you for answers, which is uh, w there's been an enormous amount of downward economic pressure on traditional media, mm -hmm. and that has come at a price to the product, there's no question. Fewer major news organizations in this country have foreign bureaus, fewer have domestic bureaus, mm -hmm. fewer, like one of the reasons why there's a sense that all power is concentrated in the White House is because every TV reporter does every story, no matter what it is, from the North Lawn of the White House, because mm -hmm. there aren't TV reporters anywhere else sure. who are paid. Uh, by those organizations. So, mm -hmm. you, you, how, how, how come you seem to have faith that there's an economic model in producing news uh, that's sustainable when all these other organizations that have a long history of doing it are struggling so much? Because um, we're making a lot of money. <laughs> but, but uh, look, can you, YouTube. Are you keeping the secret formula to yourself? <laughs> yes. Because there's a public good here that could be done by. It's not, it's, look, it's not, it's not, um, it's not rocket science. It's, it basically, there's a changing of the guard every generation in media, and we're the changing of the guard for Gen Y, and it's a different language, it's a different way of doing things, it's a different way of shooting, it's a different way of cutting. And what was interesting in the beginning was, Vice was like the kid brother. Like, oh, look at those right. crazy kids, they're fucking around with news over there. And then as it started getting bigger and bigger, it was, well, they can't be journalists because they have tattoos, or they can't be journalists because they have beards, or they can't be journalists because they're from Williamsburg. And I was always like, well, if the, all they're commenting on is our style, then we're all right. And then it was like, well, you can't be journalists because you're not doing it the way that we do it. Right. Right. And I think you have to look at, you know, wh why is Fox doomed, right? Why is the New York Times doomed? They're doomed because Fox's, Fox News, uh, skew at 68 years old, right? And they're sort of angry, afraid old people. And old people don't buy anything, so, except for <laughs> drugs. They vote. <laughs> yeah, they vote. <clears throat> well. It's a problem. Uh, and so. <laughs> <laughs> at least in this cycle, yeah, right? Sure. A... <laughs> so, you, so, so you, you look at that and you say, well, and then you have the New York Times. I look, I love the New York Times. We have our, 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 our fights, but you know, they have been the paper of record forever. The, the problem is, is they're sort of, they're galvanized into inactivity because they're like, well, we could do this and we, ah, oh, fuck no, we'll go, oh no, we'll fucking, <laughs> I don't know, video, ah, video's hard, we'll do no fucking. And so, um, quite frankly, you have to start from scratch. You have to start it, it has to be organic, it has to work, it can't be created in a boardroom. And, and I, I, when people at Fox say, hey, you know, what should we do to you know, get Gen Y, or how are we going to make, well, well, they've been number one for 40 quarters, but, you know, what's, and, and I always say, you should enjoy it. You should, you know, get the gold watch and get your pension and just enjoy your, because it's over. Yeah. Like, so there's no, there, in your view, yeah. uh, there is, there's no model where traditional media that is trying to make it, that transition I don't think can, can succeed no. in the long term. I don't think because so. there's, a lot of, there's still a lot of good product coming sure. out of the New York Times that you can find yeah. online and even good video and other things. But, yeah. but to succeed in this environment, you well, need no, to be the, organic. What the, what the New York Times does is amazing. But newspapers will continue to shrink. Right. It's all mobile, right? And if, if you don't have a mobile solution, then you shouldn't even show up to the gate. And unless you've been investing in technology, unless you've been, and by the way, unless you have all of your people who have grown up only having mobile devices, then again, you shouldn't come out of the gate. Because 
my dad will read the New York Times in, as a newspaper, and you're like, great, so you should enjoy the time when people will do that, but that's right. over now. Right. And it's, we're, not going, we're not ever going to go, like Time, the biggest magazine in the world. Right. What's the forecast for the future of time? It's, it's, uh, it's definitely a struggle. It was uh, becoming one when I left, and, it, and I, you know, I admire the folks at that organization and others who have continued to, uh, to fight to maintain relevancy and to, to try to make a profit, but it gets harder and harder. Right. But f for me also, if the product, and you're saying the product suffers, if the product is Fox News or MSNBC, I don't want that product. Right. And it's a lot cheaper to produce that because it's just a lot of hot air often. Sure. And, and the, uh, you know, going out and getting the news, embedding someone with ISIS, sure. uh, sending somebody to Liberia to report on Ebola and, and, and take that risk and mm -hmm. find the story, that's an expensive proposition. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess people who are still at least partly tied to traditional media look at something like Vice and others and say, are you willing to make the necessary editorial investments mm -hmm. for, you know, to maintain levels of editorial standards mm -hmm. that ha have become so crushingly expensive to maintain for some of these or other organizations, or is do-it-yourself journalism, as they've sometimes called mm -hmm. vice, uh, you know, a kind of viewer beware proposition? Well, I think it's changed. I think, for example, when you look at our, our coverage, um, of ISIS or Ebola or Ukraine um, or, you know, Tahrir Square or Taksim Square. A lot of what we do is live streaming. So, so everyone's saying something, and, and, but we're just showing it to you in real time with no commentary. I think the day of the voice of God, right? you know, for an hour a night telling you what you're watching and what it means and what you should think about it is over. And I think that's good because Gen Y is the most sophisticated media cohort of all time. Very smart, very savvy. And they can tune into something and watch it, and that's why we call what we do immersionism, in that we go more on a documentary film-making philosophy where you go in and you press record, because the story evolves. Right. It's not like, oh, there's a fire at City Hall, Jimmy, get me two pictures, you know? And <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we, you know, so, so that whole era of, and it's funny, because like, will you have the same standards you have to understand that Gen Y grew up with um, weapons of mass destruction, with, oh, Saddam Hussein is harboring Al-Qaeda, even though anyone with half a brain knew that they were a secular regime and they were natural enemies. The, the, the irony is now you see what's happening is we go into Iraq to get out Al-Qaeda and then fuck it up so bad that we create ISIS, which is Al literally what makes Al-Qaeda look like a tea party. Right. And, and, and you sit there and you, you have to understand young people see that. And so when you say, well, are you going to have the same standards and practices? Are you going to have the same, you know, if that's the gold standard of, you know, everyone was marred by that sort of, everyone knew what was happening. The New York Times, everybody. Sure. And you, if that's the gold standard of, of, of integrity, you can have it. Well, I think that's a great point. And I... Young people, clap. Yeah. I want to... Old people are clapping too. The, the, when you talk about your core audience and the disillusionment that that, that generation has uh, developed in the wake of uh, the failure to change everything that's wrong with Washington in the last five and a half, six years, uh, are, does that translate into a uh, withdrawal from political activism in your mind? Or, or because people were already saying that in 2012, and I think Republicans were banking on it in mm. 2012, and they said there's no way mm. Obama, because he's disillusioned and, and, and disappointed so many people, that he's ever going to have that same electoral mm. model, including the, the record-setting levels of youth vote, mm. uh, again in 2012 that he had in 2008. And in fact, young people voted even more in 2012 than they did in 2008. So are they... Have, have, have we really screwed them up now? Yes. Now in 2014, are they done? Or what I, what I would be worried about, and we're, we're out of time, <clears throat> but I'll finish with this light note, is, <laughs> is we spend a lot of time um, embedded with um, ISIS, but you know, all the groups in the Middle East. But Arab Spring effectively mm -hmm. was a youth uh, mm -hmm. uh, revolution um, <clears throat> with the socialists and the anarchists and the youth action for pieces and all these. 
in, in, in Europe. Um, and, and, and here we were embedded with Occupy Wall Street. <clears throat> and what I will say is you have a whole generation that's just getting back on its feet. Uh, they've been disenfranchised economically, they've been disenfranchised politically, they're dissatisfied with the media, they're young, mm -hmm. which is dangerous, <laughs> and they're pissed off. And God help us when the next economic downturn comes, because you're going to see Europe explode, you're going to see Southeast Asia explode, you're going to see the Middle East explode, and if America hasn't forgotten its revolutionary past, America's going to explode as well. You heard it here first. <laughs> Thank you all very Thank much. You.